Welcome back everyone to our Dole Institute virtual post-election conference for 2020 elections. Our guest today is Mr. Max Glass, who managed Senator Barbara Bollier's campaign for United States Senate in Kansas. We're delighted to have Max with us. Uh, thanks for joining us. Sure, happy to be here. Could you take a few moments uh, so our uh, watchers can know a little bit more about you personally to talk about your upbringing, your education, and how you got interested in politics? Sure. Um, well, I, I was born in Danville, Virginia. Um, it's right on the southern border with North Carolina. And um, I, I ended up going to UVA where I met Larry Sabato. And um, I kind of kicked off my interest in government and American politics. And then um, uh, after that, I actually went into the private sector for about eight years um, after college. And um, I, I just, I, I got to a point where it, it was just kind of soul killing work and I wanted to do something different. So I ended up uh, going to American University, getting my master's degree in uh, applied politics. And then I hit the road and I've been managing um, campaigns all over the country for the past 12 years. Um, I've had some uh, extremely interesting candidates, a lot of great experiences. Um, I managed uh, Tulsi Gabbard's uh, first congressional race in 2012. Um, before that, I'd worked in uh, state ledge uh, campaigns kind of all across the Midwest, um, Ohio, uh, Iowa, um, some of Virginia, uh, a few other places, and I uh, also managed uh, Seth Moulton's uh, primary campaign in 2014 in Massachusetts, um, and uh, Lisa Blunt Rochester in um, Delaware, um, her campaign in 2016. Most recently, I managed uh, Abdul El Sayed's uh, gubernatorial campaign in 2018. Um, really interesting race, and a fascinating politics at play. And, um, and then, yeah, and then I came here to Kansas. Um, I met Barbara, Barbara and I had an eight hour interview and uh, it, it, we just had the best time uh, kind of spending all day together. And after that, I knew I had to work for her. So, um, you know, it was really exciting to be here and get to work with her and kind of the tremendous team that we built here. Well, you, you got in and you guys had a primary, but, uh it wasn't a super serious primary. What was your assessment though on the other side of what was going on in the Republican primary? That's a great question. You know, I, I think for us, um, <clears throat> we tried to make sure that the campaign was not just focused on Kobach, that, that we were really trying to show, um, uh, I think both uh, people here in the state and nationally that we were building a campaign um, that could be competitive regardless of who came out of that primary. Um, I think that's why for us, um, at least on the campaign side, uh, you saw a lot of the early work that we did um, in terms of getting out early. We started, we started television in May um, with Barbara. Um, Barbara, two camera, you know, just here's who she is, here's why she's running, here's what she wants to do. Really trying to define her early um, and use the Republican primary and kind of the negative um, uh, stuff that was happening in that race is kind of a backdrop to say, hey, here's, here's somebody who's not those people who are over here fighting. Um, and really try to take advantage of that opportunity to um, kind of build this fortification around Barbara to really insulate her from the attacks that we knew were going to come later. I would imagine, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm going to ask you a question about it, but I would imagine like the Kelly campaign two years ago, you would have been happy, a little bit happier to run against former Secretary of State Kobach. Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it, the, the guy is a national lightning rod. And, um, you know, we, ra we ended up raising $28 million total. Um, but you got to wonder how much money would we have been able to raise um, if Kobach had actually been the nominee. Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a fascinating question to, to contemplate. Although I, I will say with kind of how things turned out, I, I don't know um, if he would have been necessarily easier to beat than, than Marshall, um, just, be, just, just because of how things turned out. It, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to think of what, what would have uh, happened if Kobach had won that. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. You know, I will say we were, I think the campaign team, not Barbara, but the campaign team were most worried about Bob Hamilton coming out of that. Um, simply because uh, he, he just didn't have as long, as, as much of a record um, in terms of something to run against. 
um, in a way to, to make a contrast. Um, plus he, he, he had, um, you know, what seemed uh, at least on paper to be a fairly large amount of money that he could have put in for himself. Um, I think with Marshall, he, um, I, th I think he exposed, there were a lot of weaknesses that were exposed over that, that we were able to use um, uh, throughout the primary to kind of maintain interest from kind of national groups, um, even, even though he won the primary. Um, it, was, it, was, it was an interesting thing to see, um, to see how it played out uh, in the end. Did you find the Republican results interesting in that it appeared to be a competitive race all along, and yet at the end, Marshall had clearly pulled away. Yeah, I, it 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 was. I, there's um there's definitely it, it was it was kind of a it was kind of confusing to us because we would see poll numbers and we'd see enough poll numbers from a variety of outlets, and um, it was just kind of all over the map um, for the whole time. And um, you know, it seemed like what I think ended up happening was Marshall just, when it came down, it came down to a question of electability um, and Marshall just pulled away in those last 72 hours and he did, he just won all of those kind of undecided votes that were still sitting out there, um, which happens, you know? And um, so it was a little, it was a little surprising, um, but, you know, I think um, with the amount of money that, the Republican establishment from DC was pouring into the race. I think it would be hard for anybody um, to compete with that, mm -hmm. um, especially in those last two weeks. I mean, those last two weeks, uh, they were spending around, I think it was three to four million. I'd have to look back, but it was around three to four million dollars a week um, trying to pull him over the finish line. And um, you know, that's 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 hard to stand up against, uh, especially if you're somebody like Kobach who doesn't exactly believe in uh, fundraising. Right. You know, it's difficult. Right. Well, talk a little bit about after the primary, what you and the Boulier team felt was your pathway to victory, your strategy that would result in success in November. Sure. I think, um, well, there, there's kind of two ways to look at this, I think. Um, one is from a message standpoint and then from the kind of a number stamp, uh, standpoint. For us, it was about uh, numbers wise, it was about maximizing um, urban and suburban votes as much as possible in uh, population centers across the states. Um, so especially in Johnson County, um, kind of the third congressional district, really making sure that we could run up the score as much as possible there, um, while trying to um, win, however slim a majority in Sedgwick County um, and preventing kind of complete overruns of the votes in those counties surrounding the collar counties around Sedgwick. Um, that was really the core. We also had some um, kind of growth opportunity, uh, we thought, in Crawford County, Ellis County, and Ford County, um, and a few other places uh, kind of throughout the state, smaller, smaller places, um, uh, 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 Saline County, I always get that wrong, um, especially in, in Salinas and a few other places, um, where we thought we'd really be able to kind of grow um, the margin and try to get as close and, and mimic as much as possible the Laura Kelly path to victory in 2018. Um, I, I think that was all pretty straightforward. Um, from a message standpoint, our goal was we wanted to be up on TV, um, at the highest level possible throughout the election and as early as possible in order to build that fortification around Barbara. Really trying to get people to feel, Barbara was so good to camera, we wanted people to feel like they knew who she was. Um, and the more we thought we could forge that kind of emotional connection as much as is possible with television and, and other ways, that it would make the attacks that we knew were coming, you know, <laughs> Barbara as a socialist, um, you know, Barbara's uh, votes on abortion and these other things, um, we thought it would make it harder for those to stick in a way that, um, that disqualified her for, um, especially for those moderate Republican voters. Max, uh, how did you guys find, I mean, you have, as a Democrat in Kansas, you have one obvious huge barrier and yeah. that's the partisan ID on the Republican side. How mm -hmm. are you guys trying to overcome that? So we, we did a lot of work um, and a lot of research, both um, via polling and, um, and, and qualitative kind of uh, qualitative 
research strategies with um, online discussion boards, especially once COVID started, um, and, uh, and focus groups and others, trying to figure out what were those moderate Republicans that, you know, 17 to 20 percent of, of the identified Republicans, um, what were they looking for? right specifically how could we get in what issues could we get in and, and kind of show them a more moderate stance that would pull them our way and give them permission um to feel like they could vote for barbara without um uh, compromising their values and that's why you saw so much of our campaign was based on people like tom moxley larry hibbard and others coming out and saying i'm a republican uh in larry hibbard's case uh i'm, I'm voting for trump um, but i can also vote for barbara right and trying to set up that permission structure in a way that allowed those people to come our way and we really studied that quite a bit um there were some interesting things that came out of that data um, especially in terms of um, kind of self-identified uh, ideology versus um, on paper uh, uh, party registration. Um, we found quite a few Republicans who didn't even know they were registered as Republicans and, and a bunch of other things that, that um, really kind of complicated math. And, um, but we tried to figure out where can we find those folks and speak to them directly and really narrow er everything down to, to that segment of the electorate. Um, it, it was tough, um, along with kind of independent voters um, who, you know, I'm sure, you know, can, can kind of be all over the map ideologically. Um, but here we actually found that they were fairly, fairly moderate. And that's where we try to concentrate as much of our firepower as possible. You mentioned the Republican endorsements that the senator received. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you feel at the end of the day that helped in the campaign? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think it's an open question on whether anything we do in the campaign actually helped, right? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, looking at the results um, with Trump on the ballot, it was just so baked in. I, I do think, and, and Republican voters were so, um, at least Republican identified voters were so um, regimented in how they voted from top to bottom on the ballot um, when it actually came, came time to vote. The, uh, I, I do think that it helped in terms of our political situation, in terms of getting people to believe that Kansas um, was competitive and getting people to, to see, oh, this is how they could win, right? Um, I think that, yes, I, I, I do think that it, um, it was helpful in terms of um, creating that permission structure. Um, I just think once it got to the last two weeks of the campaign, that permission structure started to break down in the face of um, kind of national investment um, and uh, national attention, both on the presidential race and, um, and just the, the sheer amount of, um, of money <laughs> flowing into to Kansas um, in order to kind of push that, uh, that uh, message of, of remaining uh, Republican all the way down the ballot and the importance of that. For those voters, right. What was uh, what was your campaign's assessment of the opposition? Uh, well, we thought that um, Roger Marshall was a was in terms of um, looking at kind of past performance, um, um, his uh, the, the kind of known weaknesses for him, I and mean, we felt like he was a fairly weak candidate. Um, when compared to some of the other uh, Republican challengers that were running around the country. Um, I, I think, you know, you know, we never really felt like they had a consolidated campaign plan um, that, that, that they were really pushing. Um, and they didn't seem to have a lot of discipline when it came to um, uh, uh, kind of, especially press communications, um, their social media um, was, was, was uh, lacked a lot of discipline. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, he seemed like um, somebody who could be provoked fairly easily, um, you know, which we tried to do. I think Barbara's um, first debate, uh, she was particularly effective um, at kind of provoking him um, into uh, kind of uh, emotional, um, I, I won't say fits, but, but emotional um, uh, outbursts that uh, made it difficult um, for him to really stay on message. 
Um, but again, we never truly felt, we knew that, that Marshall was our opponent on paper, but I think our real opponent were just national Republicans, uh, SLF, Senate Leadership Fund, um, the RNSC, those were the folks that, that we were the most concerned by, um, simply because we knew that if this race was going to be competitive, that those folks were gonna train all of their guns on Kansas. And uh, we were gonna to have to be able to stand up to that and continue to um, push a message forward at a level that uh, would actually break through kind of all of this clutter, you know, all of this kind of barba socialist clutter um, uh, to, to still be able to communicate to the voters that we needed to be talking to. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the debates. Did you feel that the debates had any real impact on the outcome of the election? No, not at all. But, okay. and, and that's not a new opinion for me. I, I don't. I, 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 I just I think that they they exist for um, for the press. Um, I think they exist um, just for an overall kind of horse race assessment um, uh, for folks. It gives it gives people things to talk about, but I, I don't think it actually changes any votes. And I don't think people pay that much attention to them, especially um, once you get past the presidential level. Yeah, I I would tend to agree with you. Yeah. Now, one of the things that uh, that we all had to do starting last March was learn how to operate in a different world. So talk a little bit about the challenges presented to you as a campaign manager and to your campaign running in a pandemic. And, and working for a doctor in a pandemic, right? Um, I mean, you can't, you can never forget that, that, that Barbara is a physician and uh, uh, Barbara's uh, husband is is a frontline physician as well, so they had uh, they actually had even even more kind of restrictions uh, on them in in terms of um, maintaining a safe household um, where they could both uh, uh, still live together. Um, and for us, you know, we uh, we ended up we moved to remote work, 100% remote work. I think um, uh, the second week in March, and um, I think because of the way that we structured our campaign's culture, um, we're very collaborative, very open, um, a lot of communication, a lot of access to information that I think um, most campaigns would have been a little bit more hesitant to share with um, kind of junior staff. Um, we were able to make that transition fairly easily. Um, we moved into, uh, into telework, um, kind of constant communication, a lot of Zoom meetings. I mean, we were able to, to get into that. I think from a campaign perspective, it increased, A, the, um, the importance of low dollar money in the election. We made a lot of investments um, in March in terms of building up our online uh, uh, fundraising infrastructure. Um, it, uh, really increase the importance of call time uh, fundraising for Barbara herself, um, and that uh, that that is uh, that's kind of a difficult thing to move into. Um, and then it made it really difficult um, to show um, to show both our our in-state supporters um, at the national level as well, and then just voters that we were still going to be able to move around the state, even though we were moving around virtually, um, because we did have a commitment to uh, maintaining uh, uh, kind of strict adherence to CDC guidelines and kind of best practices throughout the campaign moving forward. Um, we were able to put together um, uh, a lot of kind of geographically central um, uh, uh, Zoom uh, town halls, teletown halls. I mean, uh, one of the things that was interesting about it is when you take away geography as a as a um, uh, hindering factor, um, you still have to have a way to kind of manage um, uh, that that geography. So we ended up kind of maintaining our um, uh, geographical focus. Um, so we would have like teletown halls instead of doing um, something that would be like uh, women for Barbara teletown hall statewide, we would still kind of maintain kind of, we're going to do an Ellis County teletown hall, we're going to do Ford County teletown hall, like kind of maintain that to show that we were still able to move around the state and that those parts of the state were still important to the campaign, um, even though we were in, we were in this um, uh, 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 limiting situation. 
talk a little bit about uh, the money on both sides of this election. It it was by I think any account the most expensive election in Kansas sure. history, but uh, you guys raised a ton. Uh, talk a little bit about your total expenditures and then independent expenditures. Sure. So um, I think the last numbers I saw is we had uh, we had about. 15 million um, in outside expenditures, if you count kind of the sunflower pack stuff. Um, and then we had, uh, we, we raised $28 million um, directly into the campaign ourselves. Um, that was a really, it was really interesting to see how that money came in. Uh, we had a real uh, challenge in that we could not set a goal high enough that still felt realistic um in order to gauge uh, uh our, our our income versus how much we could spend at that time it, it, was, it was a really interesting operational challenge in that we would say okay uh we, we're going to start the campaign our budget is eight million dollars that's how much money we think we can raise as a as a democrat running for u.s senate in kansas right so um we raised eight million dollars by i think march um, and then we're, okay, well, we think we can get to $15 million. Um, we raised $15 million uh, uh, by the end of August, um, and we raised $13 million in the month of September, essentially. Um, it, it was uh, 12, I think $12 million, and then the rest kind of came uh, throughout that. Um, and, it, it, you know, a lot of that, uh, I think, is because of the hard work that Barbara did early in terms of that early call time that she did, we'd raise a million dollars, um, I think by the end of January. And we took all of that money essentially and were able to reinvest that into our digital fundraising um, uh, program and really build our email list quickly, um, get our direct donate ads up across social media at high levels um, and just begin to compound. Um, at the same time, uh, we had favorable polls. There was a poll that came out right after the uh, primary in August um, that showed us essentially tied. Uh, it was a PPP poll. I think Emily's List did it. It, um, it, it actually kept us in the race um, once Kobach was, was no longer uh, a, a potential opponent. And that was when we saw kind of our, our first really big explosion of online money um, throughout August into, into September when RBG passed, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, um, we had actually just gotten uh, placed onto the kind of um, uh, Pod Save America Get Niche uh, Fund. Um, that uh, we, got, we got on Wednesday, I think she passed away uh, a, a couple days later. Uh, if we hadn't have been on that, we would have raised probably $20 million instead of $28 million. Um, but it was all these little things kind of built up and, and kind of making sure that we were in that position to take advantage of anything that could have happened um, and maintaining our competitiveness nationally um, that allowed us to raise that level of money. Um, on the other side, uh, you know, we always knew that, uh, you know, I think Republicans take a very different approach um, to fundraising, uh, at, especially at statewide campaigns. Um, you know, they tend to bring in things via super PACs. And uh, we always knew that, you know, it's hard to, to say, well, you know, we outraised this guy 10 to one, um, that puts us in a, in a good position because you know that that super PAC money is just, just out there kind of looming, um, waiting, to, uh, waiting to be spent if needed. Um, and I think Republicans were really smart in the approach that they took, kind of waiting, 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 seeing, you know, what, what could happen. I mean, we never saw a poll that really showed Marshall dropping below 45 percent, um, even before they had really done any, um, any communication, paid communication at all. Um, so, you know, they, they, Republicans in Kansas have every advantage, um, every advantage conceivable. And, um, you know, for, for us, it was, it was we, we, we tried to ignore uh, kind of what was going on elsewhere and really focus on what we could do to continue to push um, our numbers as much as possible. Because we knew that, it, you know, Republicans were always going to be there for Marshall. We didn't know if they would, if Democrats would always be there for us. They had other, they had other spending priorities in addition to, to this seat. So, um, you know, for us, it was about trying to show that we were the best investment possible, but also having that, um, that 
uh, uh, level of funding that let us push back and communicate a message strongly, um, no matter who was involved in the race. Mm -hmm. Max, can you take a minute to kind of describe uh, what your attack strategy was vis-a-vis -vis Marshall and also how well you think it, it worked? I, well, you know, look, I think um, what we wanted to show was that Roger Marshall was essentially a DC politician. Right, um, kind of uh, that uh, a lot of the the kind of Sunflower State Pack um, really kind of started that, set, set that attack um, line in motion with some of the kind of swamp ads that they were doing. Um, we also wanted to show them as somebody who uh, just wasn't really ready um, to represent Kansas um, uh, in the U.S. Senate um, through some of his kind of past adventures, um, you know, the uh, uh, the incident he had um, with his neighbor um, and uh, so, some of the other things that, but really showing that this is a guy who's in it for himself. Um, I think, you know, one of the most interesting parts of the campaign that I think never really got as much attention, especially among voters as it should have, um, was the article that the KC Star came out with, um, I think it was two weeks before Election Day, uh, kind of showing um, Marshall's support for uh, physician-owned hospitals um, and some of these other things. That's something that we saw in our research as well. Um, we really wanted to try to highlight, um, here is somebody who um, is going to do whatever um, Republican leadership tells him to do. Um, Whereas Barbara was an independent, and set up that contrast with Barbara as kind of an independent voice. She's always going to put Kansas first. Um, now, again, it, 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 an election where the uh, electorate uh, seems to not have a lot of problems with um, Republican leadership, that's probably not going to be very effective. And I don't, I don't think it was. I think, um, you know, people were willing to overlook um, the personal stuff, um, especially, you know, um, we actually did a focus group, we asked folks um, what they thought about, uh, you know, Roger uh, Marshall potentially running over his neighbor with the car and some of these other things. And uh, they'd be like, well, what did the guy do to him? You know, it, it was kind of fascinating, the responses that we got back and people trying to find a reason um, to give him the benefit of the doubt. And um, I think that's that kind of uh, Republicans always, uh, uh, always have a nickel in their pocket. Uh, Democrats are always a penny short. Um, that's kind of what we saw constantly. How damaging were Marshall's attacks and the Republican attacks on Senator Boye? I, you know, I think the only thing, and, and I said this to the KC Star, and I'll say it again, I think the only thing that his attacks really did was just remind people that Barbara was a Democrat. You know, um, it, it, it really came down to kind of a Republican versus Democrat. In this race, we were never really able to, to, to get past that. Um, that kind of Democrat label. And, um, you know, it just, it, it is what it is. Uh, the, um, the abortion attacks really worked with um, folks who, um, who are pro-life in this state, right? I mean, that's 49% of the vote right there. And, um, you know, they, they work, it works. Um, you know, I think the gun attacks, some of the other things, um, you know, I, I think, again, they, they just, they just, what, what they succeeded in doing was breaking down the permission structure that we were trying to build, right? Um, and it's hard to do. It's hard to do in a state like this. You guys had uh, a tremendous amount of attention from the national media. Mm -hmm. And I've lived in, I've only lived in Kansas for about 20 plus years, but I've never seen the national media basically say a Senate race in Kansas is competitive. Um, other than kind of in, in 14 when Roberts was up, but, mm -hmm. but running against an independent, how were you guys able to get the media uh, to be that um, positive on your candidacy? It took a lot of work. Um, it took a lot of work and, and a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, phone calls kind of um, forcing our, you know, our goal was to force people to, to, uh, see the numbers in these polls that were coming out uh, and, and just constantly kind of battering down their, um, their uh, beliefs in the, uh, just the, the, the bright redness of Kansas. Um, you know, look, I, it's, uh, 
for us, it was, we had, a re we had really good partners at the national level from Emily's List and from the DSCC. I mean, especially they were, uh, 314 pack is another, a few others. Um, they, they were all incredibly invested in this race. It's a real testament, um, I think, of Barbara and Barbara's kind of um, uh, just, just her place as just a special candidate. She was everybody's favorite candidate um, throughout, throughout the campaign, um, just because she is such a genuine person. Um, and, and she was doing this for kind of all of the right reasons, wanting to represent the people of Kansas, et cetera. And um, I, I think that because we had that, um, that level of commitment from our partners and from the people at those organizations who were helping our campaign, we were able to really put a full court press on uh, the media kind of across the board, um, just to continue to push them to always, you know, if, if um, we were not included in kind of an article of the top 10 Senate races or something like that. I mean, we went after those, we went after those journalists, we talked to them, we said, hey, why aren't you including Kansas? What do we need to show you so that the next time you do this list, Kansas will be on it, right? And, and just being very open with our data, again, I mean, just, just very much just pushing, 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 pushing um, in a concerted effort across, you know, multiple organizations um, to make sure that Kansas was kind of getting its due uh, in terms of uh, staying, staying in media spotlights as much as possible. Uh, you mentioned uh, Senator Boyer's strength as a candidate. Yeah. Um, is that the main reason that this race appeared more competitive than the average uh, Kansas Senate race, or were there other factors as well? I, th I, th I think that has a lot to do with it. I think, um, I think the national media especially was very intrigued by her um, having been a Republican and, and recently moving to the Democratic Party and whether or not that was um, going to play a factor in allowing kind of that moderate Republican vote to come over like it did for Laura Kelly in 2018. Um, I think that, uh, look, nobody would have ever taken us seriously if she had not been willing to do the work early on, raising the money on the phone, talking with folks. Um, I mean, she was doing, as sometimes she was on the phone for seven, eight hours straight, um, just working, um, just doing the work. It, it's actually, as a campaign manager, it's, um, it, it is an amazing thing to watch when the candidate actually sits down and does it. Um, as hard as she did and works as hard as she did. Um, but that's what helped us raise that first million dollars. I mean, when we hit a million dollars for that first report, um, people were stunned. Uh, everyone that we talked to and, and who knew our number uh, were just blown away by the fact that she was able to do that that quickly. Um, and yes, she had good contacts. She, has, she had a lot of support to start from, um, but it was also just because of the, um, just, just the amount of work that she did. Um, that really built that foundation for us to be able to build everything else on top of it. Was the bulk of your money uh, spent on media expenditures or can you kind of kind of break down how you spent your campaign fund? So we decided early um, just because of the, the way that the markets were spread out um, and the price points that we were seeing from the markets at the time that t television was always going to be our primary medium. Um, I think it's really important for campaigns to kind of to make that decision early on and say, you know, if there's one place that we're going to put as many of our chips as possible, it's going to be on television, right? It's, it's the only thing that made sense um, in this state. And, um, you know, I think the bulk of our money, I think we ended up spending $13 million on television alone. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, kind of our secondary um, mediums were, uh, our media were um, paid mail. Um, we ended up doing about $3 million in paid mail, all told, including the coordinated campaign. Um, and then uh, our digital. Um, we really tried to work on how can, we, how can we message directly to folks in parts of the state that um, don't have access to broadband. Um, but how to do that digitally. Um, it was a lot of mobile um, advertising. 
Um, but we really tried to maintain a dominance on TV as much as possible for as long as possible. Um, and I think we were, we were also able to, um, to really dominate in, um, on, in, in digital spaces as well. I think the place where we really lagged behind um, was in the mailbox. Um, I mean, we were seeing, uh, there were days when uh, they would get kind of the average persuadable vote or what, what polling was telling everybody. Um, were the, the undecided kind of persuadable voters. Uh, they were getting three pieces, um, all three of them attacking Barbara and getting one positive piece from us, you know, every day. And um, that it was just the, I, I think the mailbox, the mailing that Republicans did in this race is something that really hasn't been talked a lot about because I think it really helped to reinforce the message that they were pushing on television. If I had some, if I had, something to do over again, I would have probably pushed for more mail uh, in order to combat that. Another place where I think um, SLF in particular um, were able to out communicate us is that they were also doing um, uh, kind of blind um, uh, text messaging, um, sending videos and the ads directly to kind of every cell phone registered voter cell phone they could in the state whether they were democrat or not i mean the scope the breadth of of, of the messaging that they were sending out it, it was just uh it was unreal i mean we were having voters who uh, would have a Democratic support score, according to our model, of 95%, 95% likely to support the Democrat in the race, still getting um, the attack ads against Barbara. Um, I mean, they, they were just blasting that stuff across the state. And I think in that situation, um, and there's some ethical um, kind of problems there, some legal kind of problems there, um, especially when it comes to why can independent uh, expenditures do that, but, but candidates can. We, we, ha we have a lot of laws that kind of hinder candidates versus um, independent expenditures in terms of uh, use, how that data is used and um, uh, 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 authorization laws and things like that. Um, so we weren't able to really combat, combat that directly. That's one place I wish we could have done a little bit more work, um, just a pushback against kind of those kind of massive uh, uh, attacks that were just kind of coming through that we weren't always able to see. You mentioned that one of the things that you would consider doing differently if you, you know, could go back in time would be spending more money on mail. Are there any other things like that that you kind of look back and say, what if we had done this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, from a message perspective, I think we really latched on to, um, uh, the perceived weakness of COVID, um, of Marshall's response to COVID um, in particular. Um, if I had it to do ever again, I think, um, you know, er well, early on in the campaign, polling showed that, you know, Marshall's approach to COVID and kind of his like flouting of, um, of, uh, of these um, guidelines, of the CDC guidelines, um, really did hurt him as, 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 a, um, as a candidate. I think, um, you know, we had a, we had one poll that said 75% of uh, Kansas voters supported wearing masks and supported um, social distancing and everything else, and they wanted to see that in their leaders. Um, so we really kind of got stuck on that for a while um, because the data coming back was showing us by the end of the campaign, um, Kansas didn't care at all. Uh, they felt that the that the pandemic was over. Um, uh, it was, at least that's my interpretation of it. They were they kind of moved past it, um, and instead we're looking for more of a general healthcare message and an economic message. Um, I wish we could have focused on on an economic message earlier. I wish we had um, uh, not stuck on the COVID attack and instead tried to move into some of the other kind of marshals in it for himself um, attacks earlier. Um, I think that might have made more of an impression. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's hard to say whether anything could overcome that, you know, kind of final turnout. Right, right. And, well, as we mentioned, that's one of the big challenges to any Democrat running in Kansas. Oh, exactly. Yeah. What, uh, what did you guys do, your campaign do, in terms of field operations and staffing out in the counties? It, it, was, it was interesting. Um, you know, for us, we had, uh, let's see, um, we ended up 
with 28 employees on the, on the hard campaign side, um, all of whom were remote, um, uh, some of whom weren't even in the state. I, I think 80% um, of our staff were here in state, um, mostly in Johnson County, um, but we were working remotely. Um, the coordinated campaign that was run by um, the Kansas Democratic Party uh, was also 100% remote. Um, so we did not have kind of the traditional field offices. We, we mainly relied on um, Democratic uh, county committees who had headquarters um, uh, already in order to, you know, have places to distribute yard signs um, uh, for the few activities that we had that required volunteers to congregate. Um, really, it was, it was more yard sign distribution, um, our um, uh, highway sign um, uh, uh, building teams, as we called them, and, uh, and a few things like that. But mostly in terms of field operations, we were doing everything via phone and via text message. Um, so that it could be done in a socially distanced manner. We, we did not knock doors. Um, we did put no money toward knocking doors. Um, so we didn't need that kind of on the ground um, infrastructure that you would normally need. We could kind of run everything online. Um, we had a very extremely active um, uh, volunteer base who were um, working and coordinating mainly via um, Slack. Uh, so Slack chat rooms, and, and that's kind of how we organize our teams. Um, everyone was uh, very much, every volunteer came in, we wanted to make sure that they both felt welcome in the organization. So we would do things like kind of um, giant Zoom chats where everyone could, could jump in and hear either directly from Barbara or from me, um, from our coordinated director, um, uh, Hannah Marcus or, or whoever, um, to really create that sense of camaraderie and not lose that. Um, we actually had a game night. Barbara's uh, favorite game to play is code words. We play code words via um, uh, uh, kind of an, an online uh, application. Um, those were really fun times. Um, and then uh, toward the end, I think in September, um, late September, we saw that Kind of COVID numbers were dropping. Um, we were getting a lot. We'd finally started to get invites for Barbara to start to appear um, in person again, and we found we think we we thought we had found a way to to have in person events um, uh, that that maintain social distance and um, maintain kind of CDC health guidelines when they had started to relax around then, and we started to move through the state. Um, largely using um, our political director, Zach Helder, um, had this brilliant idea of, uh, of uh, lawn chair chats. And essentially what we did is we would, um, we would show up in, in each kind of these little communities um, and, and big ones um, throughout the state. People could bring, their, could bring their lawn chairs, they could hang out, everybody was socially distanced, and Barbara could speak to the crowd, take questions, and kind of have a more traditional um, campaign interaction with voters, um, but still in a safe environment. Because um, again, we, we, we maintain that commitment to uh, safety throughout the campaign for everyone involved. Um, but once, once we got toward the end, we were able to move around again um, and really have an aggressive travel schedule um, via these, these events especially. How would you assess the final results? I know you were disappointed with them, but just kind of give your objective assessment of what happened. Well, I, I, I just, I think that um, Republican voters um, are just in Kansas are just extremely uh, regimented. You know, they showed up and they voted all the way down the, down the, down the ticket. Um, it was interesting to see that um, ballot roll off seemed to only impact Republicans. I think, um, uh, Marshall got 50,000 votes um, short of, of Trump, um, whereas we actually got about, I think, 2,000 votes more than Biden. Um, I mean, that, look, I was proud of the campaign that, that, we, that, we, um, that we put forth. I think we were able to do uh, kind of everything possible, everything we could kind of imagine. It was, at times, it was actually hard to, it's, it's actually pretty hard to spend $28 million uh, in Kansas. And uh, <laughs> it is, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, um, and we got to do a lot of things that, that we, we wouldn't uh, have normally gotten to do, like uh, 
digital billboards. Um, a lot of the text messaging and stuff that we did was fairly cutting edge that, that we, were, we were trying to test out as many um, different kind of turnout strategies as possible. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's just Trump on the ballot. It's, you know, um, there's been a lot of questions on polling. Um, what happened with the polling? Um, I mean, our polling showed that we were within, you know, it was 47, 45 in our last poll. Marshall had 47, we were at 45 uh, in our last poll. Kind of what, what happened to polling? I mean, it, it was shocking um, that, that the, the margin was as wide as it was. But again, I think there, there were just people that polling was missing nationally. Um, and frankly, if they had, if they had had realistic numbers, we would have, nobody would have even talked to our campaign throughout the entire thing. Um, cause we would have never been seen as competitive. Um, so, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, I think it's really hard to, to build a permission structure in a place where, like Kansas, where the voter registration is just so overwhelmingly Republican. I have to say on a personal note, Max, I never ran a campaign where I had trouble spending all the money. That must have been a fun problem to have, actually. <laughs> it was actually really stressful um, because, you know, as, as a campaign manager, you know, your biggest fear uh, is that you either come up short money wise or you end up with too much money in the bank. Right. There's some Senate campaigns. I think um, uh, the campaign, uh, the Gideon campaign in Maine, uh, they got stuck with 14 million dollars in the bank that didn't get spent at the end. And um, they've been getting pilloried for that. Um, so your biggest fear is that you're going to sit here and say, oh, no, we're going to have a million dollars left in the bank. Um, uh, I'm going to get I'm going to get, you know, torn up for that. And, um, you know, we ended up, I think, uh, the Monday Monday, November 1st, we had $24,000 left in the bank. Um, I couldn't believe it. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, but it, at the same time, it was fun. I mean, we got to do digital billboards. I mean, I've never had volunteers actually thank me um, as a campaign manager, but they saw those billboards, they loved it. Um, we got to, uh, to really fund the Democratic Party uh, uh, effort at a level that they've never really been able to do before. Um, we ended up having a two and a half million dollar coordinated program. Um, I think versus, you know, kind of five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar programs that had happened in years past. Um, and I think we really tried to turn out. Um, uh, well, we, I think we really educated a ton of volunteers um, for Kansas Democrats to, to hopefully inspire and get them out to work uh, on future campaigns as well and kind of set their expectations. So, I mean, look, we got to do everything that we thought possible. Um, and I, I can't complain about that. But yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was a fascinating experience. I will say that. I, I bet it was. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked a little bit about this, but uh, speak to uh, Senator Boyer's strength as a candidate what she brought to the table that you found most valuable as a campaign manager? And kind of second thing is, do you think she'll seek office again? <laughs> well, the second one I can answer, no, I don't think she will. Um, I, I, think, I think she's ready to retire. Um, but, for, uh, but, you know, I think she's, she's always gonna be open to what she can do to help people of Kansas. Um, but I think right now, she's, uh, I think she's ready to take a good year off at least. Um, you know, uh, Barbara, when, when Barbara and I first um, started talking, um, she told me that she wanted to run a campaign that was, um, that was based on kind of family values, on, on running a campaign like a family um, rather than like a business or like, a, like an army unit, right? She, she, wanted, she wanted to make sure that everybody was involved, that they felt, um, that they felt uh, connected to the campaign beyond just, you know, this is, this is what I do for a living or just getting, getting a paycheck or whatever. She, she really wanted to find people that, that could come together and, um, and build something special. And um, that's what I try to do as a, as a campaign manager too. You know, my, my kind of commitment to culture is, is, is a lot different than I think um, uh, a lot of campaigns. And uh, her and I just fit together extremely well in terms of our philosophies on kind of how we think about how political work should be done and everything like that. Um, but the second thing about Barbara that I think really made this campaign different is um, just the, the, the sheer level of work that she was able to put forth. I mean, I, I've never seen somebody um, work uh, as hard 
hard as she did uh, in terms of both doing the things that she loved out there talking to voters, um, you know, working with kind of smaller organizations across the state, trying to get them involved in the political situation, but also doing the things that every candidate hates, which is call time, asking people for money, fundraising, anything fundraising, right? Um, she really jumped into it and said, well, this is what I have to do if I'm gonna have a chance to win, right? Um, and at the same time, kind of maintaining um, a, a level of high expectations um, and um, asking great questions. I mean, she's, she's, she's smart. I, my, my joke was always, Barbara's smarter than all of us. Um, she's gonna, she's gonna help us figure this out. So, you know, I've never really, well, with Abdul and I would say with Barbara as well, I was able to kind of bring the candidate into the actual planning process and making them a part of it just because her political acumen, the way that she thinks about the state, the way that she um, thought about message and where we needed to be talking, I mean, and it just fit really well. I mean, she's, she's just a dream candidate. Um, and, uh, you know, she took direction really well. She, um, uh, she worked hard. I mean, she did hours and hours of debate prep, um, especially for that first one. I mean, she, um, I, I really have nothing to complain about. You came in, Max, as a, as an objective professional campaign manager, uh, saw what happened in this campaign. What advice would you give Kansas Democrats? They've enjoyed some recent success with Governor <laughs> Kelly's win, with Congresswoman David's win, but what advice would you give them uh, in terms of trying to be more competitive in the future? I think they need to find, um, and, and my advice to them has been, I, I think they need to find more opportunities um, to engage directly with voters over a longer term, right? It needs to be more of a permanent campaign organization. Um, and, and whether that means, you know, they're out there knocking doors, encouraging people to get their flu shot, you know, um, or, or whatever, whatever kind of, kind of uh, iteration that takes. I mean, I think they need to, they need to work harder at kind of connecting and overcoming some of the barriers that have been built up nationally to Democrats. Um, you know, I think uh, Tom, Tom, my favorite ad that we did the entire time was um, uh, Tom Moxley, uh, just an amazing guy and, and one of the most genuine people I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, and uh, Tom Moxley said, uh, you know, we spray for Democrats around here. You know, and I think they, <laughs> it, it just, it, 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 that line always killed me. Uh, Cause I'm from a rural area too, um, down in, down in Danville. And uh, they very much feel the same way. And uh, you know, it, but, but you know, they, I think Democrats really have to, have to work in terms of outreach to these, to these rural voters who just showed up in record number um, uh, uh, this time. Um, and I, I think they've, they've got to start to put more of a personal face on what it means to be a Democrat. Um, here, that's a little bit harder to uh, caricature, um, especially at the national level. Max, what are your plans? Are you going to take some time off and then hook up with another campaign? I, that's a great question, Bill. I, I don't know. I, um, I've been doing this for 12 years. I've been on the road for 12 years. This is my 21st state that I've worked in. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking into a few things um, uh, uh, in DC uh, where I might be able to actually stay in one place, um, uh, uh, maybe potentially uh, get engaged to my girlfriend and, and uh, you know, kind of move off. Um, but I'm also talking to a few candidates, you know, Colorado, uh, North Carolina, Wisconsin. These are all going to be incredibly fascinating races in 2022. Um, so I'm not limited in myself. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely taking off. Um, the month of December and hopefully January, and uh, then we'll see where we are then. Okay. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I very much appreciate your time to come sure. in and talk about the campaign. So best of luck to you. Thank you so much, Bill. I really enjoyed this. This was great. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in today for this segment. Uh, we'll be continuing the post-election conference and we hope that you'll be able to join us for other segments. So thanks. Have a great rest of your day.